Hello fellow gamers and welcome back. Here is again Captain Sitaris. And here's Seven Saturn. Today we have a special guest, Michael Gammelt, story writer and developer of Star Trek Voyager Elite Force. Hello, good to be here. Thanks for joining us and how are you doing? Pretty good. Um, just uh, happy to talk about Elite Force. Uh, it's one of my favorite uh, game development experiences. Well, as, as a gamer, uh, it's the other way around, you know, one of the most <laughs> favorite uh, gaming experiences actually Great. so we are Great. quite fond of having you here today awesome but before we go too deep into the subject maybe just a little introduction about yourself who are you right so uh, i'm michael chang gummelt i was a programmer and designer at raven software for about 24 years starting on the hex and heretic games and then we went on to do elite force which was a dream project of mine being a lifelong trekkie and then we did uh Star Wars Jedi Knight 2 Jedi Outcast, right? And then Jedi Academy, uh, which was a ton of fun to do. Um, that one. Uh, so for Elite Force, I wrote the script and came up with the characters, the Hazard team, and uh, and was also a game programmer. On um, Jedi, I got to do the lightsaber combat, the Force powers, and um, the J Jedi and Reborn AI. So that was a ton of fun too. Um, then from then on, we did you know a bunch of other games that you may or may not have heard of we did you know um, x-men legends marvel um other marvel games the wolverine game uh quake 4 wolfenstein singularity and then for about the t past 10 years i was doing call of duty games um doing multiplayer modes and other things and uh the last thing i did i was just, i was the lead designer on uh call of duty warzone for the first several months getting that just kind of up and running and then moved on to another project and now i have um after 24 years left Raven to go work at uh, Zenimax Online on a new IP that we're developing, uh, which is going to be pretty cool. So you're a real game development veteran here. Been around a while, yeah. And and before that, you know, I was doing mods and stuff. That's how I got hired is uh, I had been doing Doom and Quake mods. So this would be actually my next uh, question here, how you got involved in the gaming industry. I mean, was it something you figured you would do right when you were at school and I wanted to be a game designer, a game no, programmer or not at all. Like when I was a kid, we had, you know, one of those pong consoles that you'd actually like plug into the TV, you'd unplug the rabbit ears and plug in the pong into that. And then I lived in a, a hotel actually for a while because my parents managed it and they had an arcade. So I could, I could open them up anytime, and just give myself as many credits as I wanted to. So I played a ton of arcade games. Then I got up my Commodore in the, in high school and i wrote like maybe a hundred you know little basic games was it the 64 or the, the 128 uh, the 128, 128. Yeah. yeah so that was great i love that i had an amiga after that and then i did mods but i know i never thought i was going to get into the industry because i figured that i needed to have more of an education like specifically in programming to get to get in and once i got in i realized no you don't need any of that they, you just need to be able to to know what you're doing and uh because it was a growing industry and they needed people who were talented and just knew what they were doing. It didn't matter if you had an education or not. I probably could have gotten into the industry uh, much sooner. I was actually going to school for film school. I wanted to be a filmmaker, but this was a much more stable and reliable career and it uh, turned out to be a ton of fun. So originally you were already aiming into the, some sort of, of artistic um, mm -hmm. direction. Because you, yes, you said you wrote the script for the game, so mm -hmm. the artwork direction was already there. I think I've always wanted to create experiences for other people. You know, the first thing I did when I was like in third grade, I started writing and then I started drawing comics and then I started doing audio productions, video productions, then film and then uh, took all that with me into game making so that when we when Elite Force came along, I was like, I'm a huge Star Trek fan. I know everything about it. And... I know how to write scripts and, and that sort of thing. Let me write it. And they're like, okay. And I got to write it and it was great. It was a ton, ton of fun. Speaking of which, um, you, you say you, you're a big Star Trek fan. And what was your first contact? I mean, there are a lot of people out there who, who <laughs> clearly say it's TOS. Uh, was mm -hmm. it the same for you? So we didn't have a TV in the 70s, but I remember seeing, well, I don't know if I remember consciously seeing it, but my, my mom told me we went and saw Star Trek The Motion Picture. And she said I fell asleep during it, <laughs> but I was pretty young. And so I, I, my impression at the time was like, oh, what is this uh, ripoff of Star Wars? Uh, you know, and this is like, it's a ripoff of Star Wars and it's kind of boring. Uh, but then when Star Trek II came out, it was I was just the right age for that. And I loved that. That was just 
amazing. So I'd say probably Star Trek II was the first time I really got hooked on Star Trek. And then I discovered in reruns, because by then we had a TV, I discovered uh, the original series in reruns on TV and got uh, really into it then. I bought the compendium and all the technical manuals and I was reading up all about it. And so I'd say early 80s is probably when I discovered uh, Star Trek. And since you're basically working your whole life in the gaming industry, are you still having fun playing games for yourself? Oh yeah. And so do you also play the Star Trek games? Yeah, um, I do enjoy, I, I play tons of games. Probably mostly I like to play single player games with a good story and um, good mechanics like uh, Ghost of Tsushima or um, the Spider-Man game that came out pretty recently on the PS4. But I also really like games that have a sci-fi bent to it like um, The Outer Wilds was really great. Um, games with a strong, interesting narrative I always I find really interesting. But I also will play, you know, action games with my friends and that sort of thing. So it really depends on, you know, what I'm looking for. There hasn't been a lot of Star Trek games. I've played some of them over the years. I'd say my favorite Star Trek game of all time is probably Star Trek 25th Anniversary, which to me felt one of the most faithful to, is you know, it's an adventure game, but it felt the most faithful to me to the original series in that It was episodic. You, you know, solved things mostly through dialogue and, and uh, story and that sort of thing. Um, which is why when we got Elite Force, I'm like, uh, you know, uh, or, well, it wasn't called Elite Force then. Originally, it was going to be Star Trek Insurrection. It was going to be an Insurrection video game based off of uh, Star Trek The Next Generation Insurrection. And um, I was like, that's just weird because Star Trek is not a first person shooter. It's, you know, it's about story. It's about characters. You know, it, it's not an, an action oriented kind of thing, which is why we came up with the hazard team and all that other sort of stuff to, to give there further to be an excuse for why you're playing in all these dangerous situations and have to fight a lot. Mm, so basically you wanted to make it look and feel Star Trek, which I believe worked just nicely, but uh, where did you get the inspirations for the story, actually? So the story was kind of a joint project between uh, all of us. Like I said, it started out originally as a Star Trek insurrection. Originally, it was going to be uh, Worf, not Tuvok, in charge of the uh, hazard team. So our thought was, from the beginning, we were like, okay, we've got to have some excuse for why you're going around shooting your phaser all the time. It doesn't make sense for you to be one of the main crew going into all these dangerous situations all the time. So we came up with the idea of the hazard team that's like, okay, you know what? It doesn't make sense to send the <laughs> the senior crew into all these dangerous situations. We should have a team that's that's our job specifically to, you know, uh, go into these dangerous situations. So that was the original concept for the hazard team part of the story. And then Worf would have been in charge of that. And then we knew we wanted to do a lot of different settings that we didn't want to, like we wanted to have it feel kind of episodic and not repetitive, like not in one setting. We wanted to have all these different environments and aliens and stuff. Uh, so that quickly led to the idea of, you know, them getting sent to some, you know, Sargasso Sea, Bermuda Triangle type place where ships get stuck and lost and, and there's all these different ships there and you can explore them. Uh, and so that was basically where that story came from. Then at some point it switched, the license switched from uh, Insurrection because it didn't do very well to Voyager because that show was still on and um, was still on TV and we figured, okay, that'd be a good tie-in. So we changed the story around a bit and it became more of a, about Voyager, which was fine by me. I, I, I really uh, enjoyed writing for Voyager. What was the time frame? I mean, it kind of switched the direction. Was this rather early on or somewhere in the middle? Or early when on, did it I'd say before we went into really active development, uh, it switched over from Next Generation to uh, Voyager. So it was still easily doable. Oh yeah, yeah. It didn't really. It wasn't disruptive at all. It was more in the early, you know, story writing phases. And I hadn't even started writing the script yet. It was all just story stuff. But then soon after that, I started actually writing the script. And I would write the script, you know, after hours, at home, um, and then program during the day. So it was mainly your own inspiration. I'm asking specifically because, gotta ask, have you ever seen the Voyager episode, The Void? Yes, I think I remember that one. Hold on a second, let me, let me look it up because I don't know Voyager's episodes as well as Next Generation's in the original series. Or if you want to recap it for me. Well, it's I've the one where they Voyager. get sucked into some sort of uh, pocket and uh, having a hard time getting out there. And there are already a lot of ch chips in there, oh, which right, yes. basically are preying on each yes. other. 
So uh, that one came out after our game. Yeah, after yeah. we were working on the game. I wonder if uh, if they were inspired by. It. I mean, like the we, I sent the script uh, to the Voyager staff, so you know um, Brandon Braga, you know, looked it over and okayed it, and and um, they would send back notes if uh, if there's anything needed to be changed. And I've talked to to him a couple times about about it, and I think he enjoyed it. But yeah, there was that, and they also at some point had what was it? I can't remember if it was Voyager or. No, it must have been Enterprise that they had Makos, basically like Marines on the ship. Yeah, uh, which is basically was kind of like the idea of the Hazard Team. Not not quite. It wasn't as militarized. Uh, the Hazard Team. It was more. Here's a bunch of specialists that will, you know, send on away missions. Which I actually find a lot more realistic. I mean, if you come to think of it, uh, why yeah. would you send your senior officers <laughs> exactly. everywhere? Doesn't make much yeah. sense. Because they're the stars of the show. Yeah. Yeah, of course. I mean, I know why Hollywood is doing it this way, but <laughs> when you think about the real situation, you would never do it. No, no. So, so kind of they may have gotten the inspiration from you there. Maybe, I mean, maybe, it, maybe, it really yeah. strikes you. If, if you haven't seen the show and you think, well, it's a nice story, if, but if you've seen both the game and the show, you can't help but see the similarities. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, if I ever uh, talk to Brandon Braga again, I'll have to ask him if he remembers <laughs> where that came from. Which I actually also find really cool that they take the time and look at your script and maybe give you some yeah. pointers or stuff like that. And uh, I, I wish there were more things going like that. Uh, today, you very often find that the new Star Trek or what they call a Star Trek today, you know, doesn't really feel very tracky. But uh, the captain and I have talked about this a million times. Um, why not ask the original people who did the shows? They know best. They, they could give you all the information. Yeah. They could give you the ideas, the thoughts behind it. And back then, they, they really were into those things. And I, I find it a good thing that they actually took the time to, to uh, tell you. And, and, and also the other way around. I mean, there were probably a lot of game companies which don't really care about things like that. And you did it. And I think this shows. Yeah, I, I think um, it was a good collaboration between us and Paramount uh, it went it worked really well they were very hands off too they you know they would give us feedback and say what we can and can't do like you know if i wanted to have an alien and like well that alien isn't actually on the voyager there's no crew members on, and then i'd be like okay but then i could come up with like but in this one episode there's this one beta zoid uh you know mentioned or whatever or, or, or whatever yeah. and i could call that out and they'd be like oh okay so like there was some negotiation back and forth there about you know what we couldn't couldn't have in the script and that sort of thing but it was all great uh, it's a positive experience I, I loved working with them what i find so funny about it is that uh, if i take this correctly then most if not all um, crew members which are inserted into voyager and the setting are named by uh, staff members of, of the development <laughs> yeah. team right a lot of them yeah um you know austin chang that was my middle name is chang and another uh, asian person who worked at um Raven, his middle name was Austin. And so I named the, the Asian character Austin Chang. And he was voiced by, oh man, who was the guy who played Vorik? Uh, Aaron Enberg or something like that? Or no? Don't know the name. I know who you mean. Yeah. Anyway, he, we picked him because his voice sounded kind of like mine, you know, kind of uh, soft and, 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 you know, a little, a little smooth. Let's see who played that guy. Uh, anyway, he was, uh, yeah, Alexander Enberg. Right. Um, and he was great. When I met him in um, for the recording, because I got to go actually go out for the recording, I was explaining the character and his nature and how he talks. And he's like, oh, so it's basically you. And I'm like, okay, yeah, yeah he got it. <laughs> yeah. he, he knew it right away. So yeah, he played Austin Chang. And um, so yeah, those two were named after me. And the funny story about that one is that was one of the names I had to really fight for. Because I'm not going to name names, but there was someone at Paramount who said, well, you can't name him that. You know, he, if he's Asian, you can't have an uh, you know, like a white first name and an Asian last name. I'm like, what? <laughs> like, are you kidding? As if it uh, were like, unheard of. Yeah. Like Don't Harry Kim, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? And then I, I found uh, 33 Austin Changs in the phone, like in the white pages. Or whatever. <laughs> I was like, okay, all right, fine. fine. <laughs> but that Proving was a very wrong. rare, yeah, that was a very rare case. Another one, I want to name one after my best friend Cuervo, last name Cuervo. And they said, you can't do that because that's a tequila that might be seen as like, you know, stereotyping or stereotypical to name a, a Hispanic character Cuervo. And it's like, okay, fine, fine. <laughs> but yeah, uh, most of the, the Hazard Team characters are, the extra characters are named after um, people who worked at Raven or, or my personal friends. Um, 
lots of extras and stuff. Like there's a Satlos and a Jaworski who are film school friends of mine. Obviously Beastman, Foster, all the other uh, people. The only one, uh, Juliet uh, Gerat was not named after anyone. Uh, I was just coming up with a, a name that I felt fit her uh, character. And there was actually, that's one of the ones where I knew there was a Beta Z mentioned in one of the Voyager episodes. And their name was Gerat. And so I said, okay, well, this is that Beta Z character because that was how I managed to get a Beta Z in the Hazard team because they were like, there's no Beta Zs. It's like, well, there is one in this one episode. They mentioned her, you know, when they were trying to hide all the all the crew members, or all the aliens or something on the ship. Or, I can't remember exactly which episode it was, but they had to hide them all. And one of them was named Gerat as a, and was a Beta Z. So I was able to label yeah, that alien onto the ship. <laughs> I got to focus on that episode. I'm rewatching them right now. And yeah. <laughs> nice to know. I gotta <laughs> look for that specific one. So it paid off to be a Trekkie, to, to know my Star Trek and be able to, you know, uh, cite references and that sort of thing and, and use that in writing the script and then in advocating for the things we wanted to do in the script. And as I said, um, it shows. It really feels Trekkie. As you said, you wouldn't think a shooter would go very well along with Star Trek, you know? Yeah. It's not a shoot em up genre, so to say. And Actually, it works just fine. It's it's believable in its own way and realistic in its own way. And um, even when, when it comes to kind of controversy, like I find the idea really smart with Alex Munro, you know, which can be a mm -hmm. woman or a man. Yeah. Which also is a really tricky way to do it, to, to give mm -hmm. a player the, the choice which gender do you want to play. It, it's more important than ever today. Yeah. That was something I felt strongly about too, is that, you know, we should allow players to choose, you know, if they want to be uh, Alexa or Alexander Monroe, let them choose their gender. You know, and nowadays we'd probably even fight to, to be even more open about that, to be non-binary if you want it to be. But to me, it felt very Star Trek. And I was also of the opinion that we shouldn't change the story, like at all, uh, if you were playing as uh, the Alexander Alex or Alexandra. Yeah, uh, just let the story be the same. And to everyone's credit, nobody pushed back on that. Everyone was like, "Yeah, totally fine." Yeah, and it's really progressive, but yeah. also very tracky. Yeah, it just yeah. fits nicely. And Star Trek has always been about a progressive, more open vision of the future, and I think that's one of the core parts of it. So I'm glad that we were able to do that. And and I've had people say that they, you know, appreciated that 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 it was really unusual, and that they really appreciated it. So, so I'm glad we, you know. Uh, I don't know if it's much of a risk, but I'm glad we did that. I have a question from the chat about the story. Early on in the game, you meet an alien life form, which is really strikingly similar to the aliens from Equinox. Was that an inspiration? Equinox. Oh, man. Uh, let me try to remember that one. That's the episode That's... where they meet the other um, Federation ship in the Death Yeah. Point. I remember the ship. I don't. I remember. I don't remember the aliens in that. They look so similar. It's unbelievable. That is a good question. Are they talking about like the the glowing creatures? Yeah. Uh, the, the ones that appear with the noise. They have some sort of device where they kind of can call them. And what the Equinox guys are doing is they are basically converting them into energy. Oh. And right. they have a oh. very similar shape. Yeah. Yeah. I know what you're talking about. Yeah. I don't think that that was an inspiration. Yeah, I don't really remember what the inspiration was for the Ethereans. I think that's what we called them, if I remember correctly. I don't think that that was a direct inspiration. I'm trying to remember if, if that episode was like fifth season or something. Yeah, yeah so that, last that episode been, of the fifth season. That would have been while we were in the we were in the middle of making the game. So we probably came up with that before that show even aired. Those characters. Yeah, yeah the show show. Um episode was on 26th of May 1999 so a little bit earlier yeah. but you would probably be yeah we had uh, up to your ears in the work the by then. yeah we had already come up with the characters by then so I think that's just one of those fun coincidences now uh, that that wasn't an inspiration by the time we started writing it I think the fourth season or maybe halfway through the fifth season we had seen you know and I had recorded all the episodes and I brought them I had recorded them all on VHS and brought them into the office so that they could watch them yeah, watching um, Star Trek for work. That's cool. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> On what side of the game, beside of the story, did you work? What area of the code did you change? So we were using the Quake 3 engine. We were one of the first games to use the Quake 3 engine. And Quake 3 wasn't even out yet, if I recall. 
And so we would get regular drops from id Software, the Quake 3 engine, and we would, you know, be trying to make a game with it. However, it had Quake 3 was multiplayer only. It had no single player uh, aspect whatsoever. So we had to add a whole single player aspect to it, you know, AI, you know, save load games, and a scripting system and all that sort of stuff. So I worked on a lot of different stuff there. I wrote the AI and pathing system for the squad. Like anytime you would go on an away mission and the team would go with you and they'd walk along the paths and like notice things, comment on it, get into firefights and that sort of stuff. That was uh, something I wrote. I wrote the scripting system with an, another guy named uh, Josh Wire. We called it, I think it was called Icarus. So we wrote that together. Uh, I wrote a camera system that was for scripting. And the idea was that you could give it directions like a director would if you're, because I have a film background. So you would say, instead of saying, put the camera at this origin with this exact angle, with this exact FOV, and try to match it to what was going on in the scene, I would say, put the camera on the track and give me a medium two shot of Tuvok and Monroe. So the camera would figure out the distance it needed to be from those two characters and the angle it needed to keep them in frame and it would figure out the right fov uh, for a medium shot and then it would put itself on the track and then move on the track as the characters moved so it was more like an intelligent cameraman and what was great about that was other than being able to just give it directions like a like a director would is if you change the scripting in the scene and had the characters walk faster or slower or stop for a second the camera would just automatically adapt and you know, follow the action. So you didn't have to re-script the camera if you re-scripted the action in the scene. So that was something that I did that I was really proud of. And then I also did multiplayer modes. And I scripted some of the early cinematics and did storyboarding and um, worked on a couple of the boss battles. And um, there was something else I did, I can't remember. <laughs> oh, some of the first uh, combats in the game, you know, when you, uh, when the scavengers invade the ship and you're fighting them in one of those cargo bays or something i scripted that as an example of how to use the scripting system uh, to do combat so lots of various stuff it was a small team so everyone kind of jumped around and did uh, different things uh, so i was kind of all over the place on it let's go for that question how big was the team i believe it was around 20 to 25 people at raven um, obviously you know voice acting and that sort of thing that was outside raven And the, the cinematics were, I think, rendered by, oh, I'm going to forget who did that. Somewhere in Europe, there was a team that did the pre-rendered sequences. Anytime you see ships flying around and not people, uh, we use them also in, uh, for the same thing on uh, Jedi Outcast. Those were pre-rendered uh, cinematics as opposed to in-game cinematics that were scripted. You said you were also in Wolf of the game modes. Which one specifically? Oh, man, that's a tough one. I think I worked on pretty much all the multiplayer game modes. And Because some of them are really tricky, especially the the assimilation mode. Yeah. Assimilation was the main one that I was really proud of that I did because I felt it was unique and very Star Trek-y. Yeah. Um, I wanted a mode that played heavily into the idea of the Borg and where the Borg and the Starfleet sides played totally differently. It may not have been the most balanced um, you know, mode out there, I'm sure, but in practice, but I wanted it to feel very Star Trek. Other modes probably played a little bit better, but I enjoyed working on that one because I felt it was very Star Trek, very much in the theme of Star Trek. I think this really depends on how experienced the players are. Yeah. If you know how the game mode is supposed to be played, then of course mm -hmm. players would have to kind of balance the situation, but mm -hmm. the idea is pretty unique. And yeah. As you said, then, pretty much Star Trek. Yeah. In any, any kind of asymmetric multiplayer game mode where the two teams aren't even, it can get unbalanced if you have much more skill on one side than the other. Or if you focus too much power in the uh, hands of one player, like the action hero mode. That was another one that was a pet project of mine. But if you got someone who is really good at, at the yeah. game already and they end up being the action hero, then they can just kind of run away with it. Yeah, yeah. This is also my experience. If one of the players has a really kind of a head start on, on game skill, then uh, once he gets the hero, things are going sidewards. Mm -hmm. yep. But yep. Uh, it, it just comes naturally. But I think we, we just wanted to do a wide variety of game modes. You know, we did the standard, you know, you know, uh, what did we call it? Was it called Deathmatch? Or what was it called? Uh, Auto match. Hollow match, right. Yeah, that's right. We did a standard hollow match, and again, our hook there was that, oh, it's a holodeck, so we can do a medieval setting or whatever. We can do, you know, whatever setting we want. 
Uh, and we thought that made a lot of sense. And um, one of the, the programmers, my boss, um, James Monroe, he came up with the idea of having the holodeck fade in at the beginning. That was great. You know, he, he did a great job. That was a nice little touch to so you know you're on a, a holodeck. It's a simulation. And we did, you know, capture the flag, which is a very basic kind of game mode, but worked pretty well, I thought, with all the gadgets and, and weapons and stuff that we had. And, it's uh, actually really funny now that I think about it. I mean, you have also characters from the Captain Proton yes, um, yeah. Yeah. aspect. Yeah. If you come to think it, you have a game where there is a Voyager, which is a story aside from the game actually you take you, you you take the player into the universe but you have characters which are fictive in this fictive universe mm -hmm. yeah. actually <laughs> taken from another show a story within a story yeah. yeah 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 now that i come to think of it it's <laughs> it's crazy kind of mm -hmm. but that was fun i love the captain proton stuff that they did that was um oh yeah fun to be able to include that and I know a certain player which loves to play the robot. What? Who? <laughs> yeah. Oh, I think I lost you there. Uh, the the, the yeah. Satan's robot. The, there's yeah, one yeah. one player yeah. skin uh, skin the, the Satan's robot. You know from from Captain mm. Proton. The, the, mm. There's this character of Satan's robot, and Captain always or very often plays with this skin. Hold on, I'm checking my settings here. I think he really lost us. Uh, so last thing I heard was uh, you have a player who likes to... We were talking about Captain Proton. Or you know a player who likes to do something. Yeah, that could be me. <laughs> yeah, it's also one thing which I find funny. if That the characters have a taunt which which fits their their character. For example, <laughs> the robot is spitting out a uh, paper lash. <laughs> right, right. So when you win, you are getting first place and it, it spits out this paper thing. Kind of <laughs> putting out the taunt. Yep, and yep. it's the small things that also make this game really lovable, I believe. Yeah, that was a lot of fun, too. I really enjoyed writing um, the main script, but then that was like 400 pages. But then I had another 400 pages of just all the miscellaneous dialogue for every single character that we ended up using. Just They're just lines, they would say, like pain sounds or whatever, but also taunts and all this other stuff. So as, much, as much stuff as I could think of for every possible character uh, and get all that stuff recorded. And we used it to, um, you know, if you were thrown in the brig, uh, if you went around the ship and started shooting people, I, you know, I had a line yeah. for everyone. We would randomize who would show up and, and they, you know, say how disappointed they were in you. And uh, that was, so that kind of stuff was a ton of fun to write too. There's a question in the Discord here um, about the ant boss uh, opponent, um, the, the whole forge idea. Did you take this from somewhere else? Did the basic idea or was it completely new? by uh, you guys or where does it come from so the end boss if you're talking about the Vorsoth yeah, yeah the Vorsoth so I actually kind of proposed a look for it that was based off this old game that was one of my favorite games uh, Star Control Star Control Star Control 2 there were these uh, aliens called the Urquan and um, I just love the way they looked. They were kind of really weird, kind of almost like worm-like things, but they were giant, you know, worm-like things, almost like navigators out of Dune, um, the David Lynch version of, of Dune. Uh, but they had these like tentacles in their, uh, for a mouth or something like that. I just thought they were kind of an interesting alien, you know, bizarre alien look. So I had proposed something like that for the end boss. And I think that's how it kind of evolved into this Warsaw thing. In the end though, I think that fight, that end boss fight was not the most exciting because the you know the the boss is so static uh, because he's just a big basically worm sort of thing uh so i wasn't too happy <laughs> with how that boss fight turned out uh, there were two of us working on it and neither of us were like super thrilled with it but we were like okay well that's it is what it is uh, but that's that's where my inspiration for it came um you know other people who worked on it they probably had their own inspirations but that was my suggestion getting back to the star trek focus uh, there's a question here set phases to frag which <laughs> actually is a, a really good catchphrase which combines track and and, and uh, <laughs> shooter gaming yep. did you come yep. up with that no no that was marketing and when they showed that to us we all just groaned we were like oh set phases to frag because you know fragging was I, I guess that that was like a like you said that was a multiplayer pvp kind of game thing and again like to me star trek wasn't about you know, action and shooting. It was. It's about characters and story and that sort of thing. So yeah, that that kind of made me groan because <laughs> uh, it felt so 
I don't know. I guess it felt cheesy to me. You know, it felt kind of anti Star Trek to me, but you know, it was a good tagline it, and it worked. I got to give it to marketing knows what they're doing, but me being, you know, a Trekkie you kind know, of a bit of a purist, I was like, Ugh. another question for the single player, single player aspect of the game. Do you remember modifying the strafe jump consciously? For instance, the air acceleration in old Raven Quake 3 games are noticeable increased compared to the vanilla Quake 3 game. Hmm. No, I don't remember doing that. I, I can't remember who worked on the movement stuff. That might have been more James Monroe than me. But I don't think we I don't think we consciously did that. That might have just been something that we did that was just kind of an unforeseen side effect. You're saying like if you if you side jump, like jump sideways? Or run sideways or if if you mean do you mean like the the weird thing where if you press forward and left at the same time you get like even faster exactly it's, it's the technique to increase your movement yeah i think we probably increased straight speed because we wanted to because we felt like you know you needed to be, have more maneuverability to be able to dodge you know bullets and that sort of thing and probably as a side effect it created that uh, diagonal uh, acceleration that probably wasn't intentional interesting I know, thing i know people uh, use that for you know um, all the time and speed runs and stuff to, to accelerate the maps quickly. It was a speed runner question. And interesting is I just began playing the campaign again and I noticed actually the speed is not that great in, in the single player in comparison mm -hmm. to the multiplayer. It's, it's really mm -hmm. pronounced in the multiplayer. You have some players which are really, really good at, at doing this and you can't even begin to understand how they can get that fast in so short of a time. You know, uh, so that was one thing that we decided early on was we had started making the single player game and Quake 3 was a multiplayer engine. And we were trying to figure out, do we want to try to make this work in multiplayer or just separate them? And so we decided to just separate them because it'd be easier for development if multiplayer and single player had completely different executables. And I think we even, did we keep that? We kept that in um, Jedi also, because then we could kind of do co-development in both and not have one affect the other and not have to get single player to work in multiplayer and worry about issues with networking and lag and that sort of thing. I think uh, so they there... did it also with Medal of Honor. So you weren't alone mm -hmm. with this decision. Yeah, yeah. And so it, it helped us develop both. Uh, but yes, there are some differences between single player and multiplayer as a result. All right. Um, we already talked about the story a bit. Um, as you should certainly know, there's Elite Force 2, which was done by a completely different team. And what do you think about their approach to the to the story so i have and a confession to make is that i've never played elite force 2. there's a couple reasons for that one is and i'll be honest i was just kind of annoyed that elite force 2 went to another studio that bothered me i felt like we had done such a good job with it why didn't we get to do it again so i was a bit kind of annoyed by that and i think that was one reason i kind of avoided it but from all i've heard anything i've heard they did a great job with it the only thing I don't like that they did was they took away the ability to play as Alexandra. So if someone played through as Alexa or Alexandra Monroe in the first one, they come to the second one and they don't have that choice anymore. They're forced to play Alexandra. I thought that was a mistake. But everything I've heard, the story was good. The mechanics were good. I've just never played it. The other reason I never played it is because it was very hard to get your hands on because yeah. of the whole fallout between Activision and Paramount afterwards uh, over the licensing issues. Uh, it was... Is barely even came out. It was difficult to get, and um, I never got a copy, and it was impossible to get a copy until now. And now that it's on GOG, I'm going to buy it, download it, and play it. You know, when, as soon as I have a little, little bit of spare time when things aren't too busy, I definitely want to play it, and I think I'm ready to experience it now. It would be interesting to to hear from you afterwards what, yeah. what you yeah. think about it, because it, it takes a little bit of a different approach to the whole. Mm -hmm as a team and then i'm well, a little jealous that they got to play in the next generation universe that's one thing i would have loved is uh, to have been able to do a next generation version of it so i'm excited to see what they did with that yeah check it out i think it's a good game but in my personal opinion elite force one was just better okay. no well, artificial um <laughs> flattery here it's it's just better well yeah I'll, i'm looking forward to trying it out and that's a good studio they do good games so it's I, I have nothing against them i just you know at the time wasn't speaking of of being ready do you think the game was ready were you satisfied with the release or were there any yeah. problems during development what, what do you what can you the, tell us about it the biggest problem during development honestly was that the engine wasn't fully ready for us yet 
we were developing and it was our first time working in that engine. There was a lot of stuff to figure out. We needed a six month extension. So the game originally was going to take two years to make. Um, there was some pre-production involved there, but we had a six months extension to finish it up. But otherwise, I think it was ready. It was everything we wanted it to be. Um, I don't recall thinking that there was much that was cut that I felt like we shouldn't have cut. I, I think it was pretty much like there's some design decisions that, you know, maybe could have been uh, better. Uh, but I don't think when we shipped it, I felt like it was unfinished. Which by um, today's standards also strikes one is uh, the modability of the game. Mm. And you probably know it is the community made tons of new maps for this game yeah, back then. Yeah. I mean, I believe I, I have more than a thousand laying around. Mm -hmm. So it's really quite extensive. Was it a conscious decision to make it that moddable or did it just come naturally because this is how the Quake engine works? It was not a conscious decision for that game. We had never really had a game that had been heavily modded before. I think it was just a side effect of it being a Quake engine game. And honestly, even when we made Jedi Outcast, we didn't intentionally make it very moddable. But when we saw how much people were modding the games, I made a conscious uh, choice in Jedi Academy to externalize as much data and make it as moddable as possible, uh, especially since I came from the mod community and I really appreciate games that are easy to mod. Uh, so by the time of Jedi Academy, I was uh, trying to make the game as moddable as possible. But no, that was kind of just a, it was a surprise to us, but a pleasant surprise. And I'm glad that people still enjoy it, you know, even now are still modding it or working on it in some fashion or another. You know, when, when the Quake uh, source code came out, that was a great thing for the community, too. Oh, yeah. The really cool thing would be if there would be something like that for the uh, single player, mm -hmm. but it's it's not very likely that we will ever see the, the source code of this game. Yeah, but anyways, that was a, um, a tough one because of the whole issues with Paramount. And, you know, yeah, you know yeah. that was an issue with um, Jedi for a long time, too, is, you know, could we release the source code because it was, you know, kind of jointly owned between Activision and LucasArts and who no one could was right really sure who had the right to say yes, you could release the source code. And we licensed the engine, right? It's from id, so there's at least three interested parties there in, in terms of who could approve releasing any kind of source code. And sadly CBS isn't currently in the mood of helping fan productions. Mm. Oh yeah. Or the other way around. Yeah, that's short sighted. Oh yes it is. Anyways, uh, the game itself today has a lot to give, in my opinion. I mean, we, we have an engine that works and is very close to the original. We also have more um, experimental engines out there, so people are still investing some love into this game. That's cool. That's great. And I think a, bit, a big part of it is actually the, the story. And the question would be, what is the favorite of you of the story? What do you find particularly well done or what story detail do you think is I, um, the really good part? I honestly enjoyed the parts where you would go back to the ship and uh, talk to crew members and they would talk about the mission that just happened. And we would have, you know, we would save out some variables for different things that happened during your missions and have that reflected in the characters talking afterwards. But I felt like that was an important part that helped put the action in context being able to go back and talk to the rest of the crew. And it was totally optional. You didn't have to do that. But I liked that you could talk, go back and talk to the characters about uh, the mission that just happened or kind of advance the character uh, relationships a little bit here and there. I also liked that we had a branching, a little bit of branching with uh, Foster, whether or not Foster got um, captured and, and uh, converted by the Borg. Um, I wish we'd be able to do more of that sort of stuff. I'd say, you know, those those are my favorite parts, personally. I like that we got to, you know, visit all the different ships, like, you know, a Mirror Universe uh, uh, original series ship. It, was, it actually wasn't originally going to be a Mirror Universe ship. It was going to be like an old Constitution-class ship, but we didn't, uh, Paramount, I mean, Activision did not have the rights to the original series, I believe, uh, okay. whatever the Division works for. I don't know, they had Deep Space Nine in the original series, and we had uh, Next Generation and Voyager. Uh, at Activision, but we made some deal with them that we could use uh, that for that for this for this game. It's a funny thing because, as I said, I, I began the campaign some hours ago, and I was thinking about this specific part that they didn't, or that you didn't, um, just pick a normal um, TOS um, Enterprise or, or Constitution, mm -hmm. but it was actually a Mirror Universe version, yeah, which yeah. I find really cool because I believe in every show there is a Mirror Universe episode. Yeah. 
Yep. And even in Elite Force, there's that aspect present. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that was fun. And it made a lot more sense than that you'd be running around fighting those people. Yeah, definitely. Were there any things that you had to cut out or that could not be finished or not or weren't feasible, technically? I we don't think remember well, we... anything like that. Like There were things like that, like licensing issues, where we couldn't use something or other. But I'm sure there were some levels that got cut at some point. I don't really remember uh, that stuff too well. I wasn't on that side of it. On the, you know, I wasn't heavily on the consent uh, side of it, like making the levels. So I'm sure there was some stuff there that was cut. There might have been a mission or two that was cut. But I don't really remember there being any major cuts or anything that was too painful that was cut from the game. I mean, we had two and a half years to make it. So it was back then, that was a lot. So there is no secret co-op mode, which we could unlock. Oh, no, 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 we never, we never even considered a co-op mode. I don't think that was uh, like, I, that obviously makes a ton of sense for a Star Trek game, but um, that was not anything we ever discussed at the time. I don't think there were a lot of games doing that sort of thing, especially shooter games doing that sort of thing at the time. So it wasn't something we thought of, but that's a great idea. If there were ever in Elite Force 3, a co-op mode would be a great idea. That's actually what I was getting at next, um, Elite Four Three. That's, I believe, a game that many, many players out there would want to see. Uh, I assume mm -hmm. you too? Especially with the co-op mod. <laughs> yeah, I would absolutely love to see a, a co-op Star Trek game, whether it's Elite Force or not. As some sort of, you know, co-op Star Trek game would be great. As long as it's not, you know, all action, right? I, I think you still have to have that focus on characters and story and have the action be there, but have it have context and uh, meaning. And not just be, you know, endless corridor shooter or something, or dungeon crawl, basically. Yeah. So if you had to give it a shot, uh, story-wise, I mean, you you did it once. If you had to redo it on a new Elite Force, which direction would you you take in in the light of the day, story-wise? Well, first, I'd want a mainstream Star Trek TV series that you know has good, compelling characters and a story, like you know, something that's more classic Star Trek and that. Here's a ship and a crew full of competent, you know, good people exploring the universe and you know having adventures, right? There's not really a show, a Star Trek show like that right now. Uh, I really think there should be. I, I don't know why they're afraid to make such a show. I guess they think it's old fashioned, but I think that's the heart of Star Trek is is that idea of this progressive vision of the future, optimistic uh, about a, a crew full of experts, you know, trying to find creative solutions to difficult problems without um, compromising their their ideals and their beliefs. I think that's an interesting and good story to tell, something that we could use. There isn't a Star Trek show like that right now. I, you know, there's a couple, the more comedic ones probably feel more Star Trek to me than like the Orville or Lower Decks than, than the mainstream ones they're making. But first, if there was a show like that, then, you know, I, that'd be the great basis for it. But assuming there was a show like that, I would love to you know, tell a story that is, you know, has some episodic qualities to it, but is maybe kind of got an ongoing story arc. Basically, like we did with Lead Force, it felt episodic, but there was a main overarching story to it. And I think one of the things that was great about us having the Hazard team is that we could have characters die because they weren't part of the, the main crew. And so I'd like to have something like that where we're introducing some new characters that may or may not survive and have you play not one of the main characters on the show, but be able to kind of role play your own character, I think uh, would be cool to, to be able to do that again. And again, make a co-op. Uh, I think that would be uh, a great idea. And of course, you know, part of it being episodic is being able to play in some of the, the, the best, like I'd love to have a, a mission with Orion Pirates. I'd love to have, um, you know, I don't know, Borg stuff's kind of done to death, but you know, you kind of have to do a Borg uh, mission, uh, you know, something with the maybe with the Cardassians or, or something, you know, really kind of explore the Star Trek universe through the game. Interesting idea. I mean, the, the Orions were explored a little bit more in Enterprise, mm -hmm. but aside from that, you, aside from, of, of course, the everywhere known um, Orion slave girl, you barely know anything about Orion. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it would actually be a, an interesting opponent, actually, because mm -hmm. you, you basically know nothing about them. Yeah, I had, um, I had actually gone to Paramount and pitched a new Star Trek series in 2015 because I knew the 50th anniversary was coming up. And I'd written um, a pitch for a new series and was invited to go out there and, and pitch it to them, so I did. And then one of the characters was an Orion security officer. But I was going to try to, through her character, 
evolve the idea uh, of what Orions are and kind of expand them and get deeper into their culture and everything and, and kind of explore them more. I thought, I felt like that was a, that's a rich culture for, you know, why do they have this reputation of being um, pirates and, and that sort of thing? And like, what is it really like to be an Orion and especially an Orion and Starfleet and all that sort of stuff? I thought that would have been kind of fun. So how can we promote your idea? And I would also vote that you are getting the rights to publish old Star Trek games in the future. <laughs> so, I mean, they looked at it and they were like, uh, this was before Discovery came out. Uh, hold on. I think my website is might still be up with the pitch on it if you want to check it out. Yeah, please send it. Yeah, Star Trek Uncharted.com if you want to check it out. The script for the pilot is on there too and like uh, the, all the characters and their descriptions are up there. Uh, I had uh, a friend of mine at Raven do concept art for a ship, the NXA-1701 because part of the idea is that this was an experimental ship with a new drive developed by a mystery person who turns out to be someone we know that allows them to actually get to the Andromeda galaxy and start exploring the Andromeda galaxy. And so it's to, the idea was to kind of get back to this kind of frontier kind of feel yeah, yeah. like in the original series where they're out there on their own at first. And over the course of, this, of several seasons, Starfleet would get a bigger and bigger presence over there. So first they'd be the only ship there with a single small star base. And then a second ship would show up in the second season and there'd be some interplay there uh, with a... Uh, uh, so it was the Enterprise, obviously. But this other ship would have been captained by a descendant of Kirk, who kind of feels like you have like the main character of this show has their ship because they feel like the Enterprise belongs... A Kirk belongs at the helm of the Enterprise. And so there was some fun stuff there, you know, that would have been a secondary character that you know kind of shows up in the episodes every now and then. But anyway, um, if you check it out, uh, that's where it is. But they, they read it and um, they're like, this is, you know, good. You obviously know your Star Trek, but we're looking to do something very different. I'm like, okay, well, you know, that's that's fine, you know. And, and then they came up with Discovery. And in a way, it was very different. In a way, I was disappointed that they were looking backwards again and doing a prequel and trying to tie it to Spock and everything. And I just felt like that wasn't really necessary, that they could have just gone forward another hundred years that i mean that's what i didn't mind right i go forward a hundred years after voyager and start telling you know what's next what happens next and they just weren't interested in that i guess at first i mean the catchphrase was to boldly go where no man has gone before right right not to like go back and recycle everything yeah yeah, yeah. but that I, i think that's kind of sometimes that's the mentality is to do something a little safer i guess not that it was entirely safe. I mean, they were definitely taking risks on Discovery. I just didn't like the, I don't know. I don't want to get into Discovery bashing, but I didn't really uh, care for the characters and the writing. I felt it was kind of melodramatic and trying to create drama just for the sake of drama rather than tell good stories and have uh, likable characters. Yeah, I think where Star Trek is, is the best is always when the drama is substantial. As I said, I'm rewatching Voyager, and of course, there are some recurring um, motives and ideas. But for example, the idea of, of the hologram uh, what rights does a hologram have? And yeah, the, the, yeah. it's actually a very basic um, question where do you draw the line between uh, machine and, and a living being? What is sentient, so mm -hmm. to say? And Star Trek was always about exploring philosophical uh, yeah. dilemma what is the meaning what does it mean to be alive what does it mean to yeah. be free what is free will what is uh yeah and uh, what does it mean to explore the universe in an ethical way uh that sort of thing yeah it, it of course shows you there are intrinsic conflicts and uh, kind of um, natural drama not not something put on top to just push up uh, some sort of, of of conflict for the sake of the conflict Mm -hmm. I, right. I think this is where Star Trek was the best, when it was yeah. actually trying to, to have a look at the human condition. Also, it wasn't always about the, that the whole galaxy will blow up in the next five episodes. Yeah, right. It was so many times in Voyager and Next Generation where you didn't have any conflict. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Where it was just exploration. Yeah, and I, I love... Um... I think because they had to make so many episodes a season now, you know, now they focus on, you know, fewer episodes, but, you know, higher quality or spending more, you know, money per episode at least. And so they get into this heavy, heavy, heavily serialized kind of format where they tell one long story, which I think kind of ruins the pacing a bit. And if you're not interested in that particular story they're telling, there's not really a reason to tune in next week, right, for a different story. 
I really like that the original uh, series and Next Generation had a different story each week. And sometimes they would refer to old stories or they'd have a two-part or a three-part or whatever. And, and, and they'd, um, they'd have some ongoing character development, especially later on. But I like that it, it was different each week and they got to tell lots of different kinds of stories. I think Star Trek's kind of been too influenced by shows that are heavily serialized. I wish there was somewhere in between. I think Next Generation Voyager and, and those shows could have used a little bit stronger development of characters. And, and I think Deep Space Nine is probably closer to that kind of feel where like there was a little bit more con continuity between episodes and stuff uh, without getting too soap opery, right? Yeah. Somewhere between those shows and what they're doing now, I think would be good. Do you have acknowledgement that things have happened before, character development over the course of a season and... Uh, uh, but still tell interesting standalone stories uh, along the way. And that's kind of what I was trying to propose when I was writing up my pitch. It was something like that. And they've gone a little bit, I think, too far in the heavily serialized, almost melodramatic uh, kind of direction for Discovery. I think the first season especially, uh, second season was a little bit better. And I'm really looking forward to Strange New Worlds. I think that's going to be exciting to see that. Again, it's kind of a prequel series, but... At least they're embracing more the idea of telling um, a little bit more episodic stories with, I'm sure, some sort of overarching story and character development. So I'm excited for that one. Going back a little bit to the game development, can you remember any funny bugs, any special moments during the development? Huh, that's a good question. There was some, some funny stuff early on. Uh, well, okay. There was some fun stuff during development where we were trying different things and trying to experiment with the, the characters. Uh, one thing that I had done that I really enjoyed that never made it into the final game was I put in voice recognition. So I had it so if you hooked up a microphone to the game and you used Microsoft Windows kind of voice recognition, it could channel commands to the game. So when you were walking around with your squad, you could call out their name. So you could say, um, you know, uh, Beastman. The Beastman would turn to you and say, what? Uh, or you'd talk to Chell, and Chell would say, uh, you know, what is it, Monroe? You know, and, and just by looking, or you could look at them and just say, hey, you, and whoever you were looking at, whoever the crosshair is on, would turn and, and talk to you. And then you could say, take cover, fall back, or, or scout ahead, or something like that. And they'd respond, and they, you know, verbally respond and go do it. And it was really cool and kind of fun, but like, you know, it never made it into the game because no one would have had, you know, like, so few people would have been able to take advantage of that. You know, have a mic. Nowadays, everyone has a microphone, right? But uh, no one really had a microphone hooked up to their PC at, at the time, so it was not worth finishing development on. But it was a lot of fun uh, to make, and it it was magic. You know, when you turn to someone and you say "Chell," he turns around and looks at you and says, "What?" It just was magical. So that was a lot of fun. But that's something that never shipped. That's what I was referring to before we started this stream uh, of of uh, not voice over IP, but. Um, of some voice related feature that I had in there. And then the other thing, other things all have to do with the voice recording sessions. I had a lot of fun going out to Paramount and getting to meet members of the cast uh, of the show and, you know, uh, having them record uh, their lines. Like I said, Alexander Denberg was great. We had uh, Janeway, um, Kate Mulgrew come in. She was just very professional. She just hit all our lines, did everything perfectly. And, um, you know, she was done in like 45 minutes. She had it all done. The funniest one was Chakotay, uh, Robert Beltran. He comes in, right? And he comes into the studio, uh, in, into the recording booth. And I'm sitting, you know, in the uh, control room with the director and um, engineers. And he looks at us and he says, who wrote this? And I'm like, oh shit. <laughs> like, he must hate it. And so I, I raised my hand and he's like, this is better than anything they're writing on the show. You should come write for the show. <laughs> like, oh, okay. You know, I found out later that he was not really happy with the show. He didn't like how they were writing his character or they felt like they were sidelining his character a lot or just didn't know how to write it or whatever. So I, I didn't know that at the time. But I thought, oh, that's kind of cool to, you know, get some praise like that. But now I think it's more of a slam on uh, or, or part of his, you know, issues with the show itself. Yeah, uh, a fair reflection of yeah, being a little Yeah, kind of bit. fun moments like that. Uh, we got the guy, uh, we had a guy come in to read for the Beastman character. It just wasn't matching what I wanted uh, for the character, what I imagined in my head for the character. And so the director, uh, Chris Zimmerman, she was great. Uh, she, she's a fantastic uh, voice director. She's done tons of stuff. She turned to me and says, you don't like him. And I'm like, well, it's just not what I imagined. He's like, all right, well, let's finish up and then tell me what 
what is it you want? Well, like, you know, I was like, well, in my head, for some reason, I just pictured this guy as Biff from Back to the Future. And she's like, oh, I know him, Bill Tanner or something like that, um, our tenant. Uh, I know him. I'll call him up and we'll get him to do it. And she, I was like, oh, okay. And so she got Biff, not Biff, Biff Tanner's the guys. I don't, I can't remember the actor's name. But we all know who you mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's uh, Thomas F. Wilson. Thomas F. Wilson. That's his. Uh, so he, uh, she got him to come in, and he read for the part, and he was perfect. He just nailed it. So yeah, that was a that was another fun kind of uh, experience in the uh, voice recording booth um, that I think really helped. And you know, his character is a bit over the top the way he's written. He's written to be kind of a jerk, but then you know, when he's you know, spoiler alert. I think it's okay. It's been twenty something years or twenty years. When he dies, you're supposed to, you know, like, oh man, he was a jerk, but he kind of sacrificed himself for us. So you kind of like forgive him a little bit. Uh, so yeah, those are some of the stories I have uh, that I remember. I can only imagine how you must have felt when you went to Paramount and doing your job there and being with the cast, because I know if I were there, uh, I would probably run around smiling all day. I would lose my ear, so to say. Yeah. I would just vanish. <laughs> so th this is actually what I find so, so nice back then it goes from many many um, Star Trek games from back then that they really took their time to do this they took it seriously and created great, great content yeah and I think they um, you know because they had to tell so many stories they were more open to you know uh, working with uh, outsiders and there was much more I think licensing going on then so they're more used to working with outside partners Unfortunately, I didn't get to tour the set. The uh, people, uh, the the um, project lead on the game and the art lead, they got to go actually like explore the sets and stuff like that in the studio head. But um, I went out just for the voice recording, so I didn't get to actually tour the set. That would have been awesome, but never happened. <laughs> Pity. So, don't know about the captain. If he has some more questions. You mentioned just a few minutes ago that it was 20 years ago that we had the amazing release of Elite Force. But for some players, it's the first year. Did you know that GOG was planning to release this game? No, I had no idea. I mean, all these re-releases, I had no idea. When Jedi came out for PS4 and Switch, was it last year? I had no idea. So uh, yeah, I don't know who figures these things out, but uh, they never talk to the dev team and tell them that this is happening. <laughs> And I don't think like, you know, whatever um, profit sharing or licensing deals we had was long expired. So we don't get anything from any of those uh, sales, you know, and re-releases and stuff, which is fine. I don't expect it to, but it's, it's cool. I'm glad they're doing it. Uh, but no, I had no idea. So we don't, we'll see any patches from you guys? Oh, I know. We don't, I don't even know. I mean, we were pretty good about holding on to source code, but I have no idea where that source code is, if we still have it, and it certainly wouldn't compile on modern machines. You'd have to, you know, yeah, you'd have to do a lot. And yeah. install, you know, yeah, uh, I have no idea, honestly. You know, like, we released the source code for Jedi uh, several years ago, and people managed to get that to work, so possibly, maybe, it, it would work, but yeah. Uh, no, we won't be doing any patches. I think it'd probably be more... Um, I don't know if GOG is, is doing anything like that, if they have the ability to patch things or if, um, or what From version looks of it, I would say no. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> I took the liberty of having a look at the multiplayer binary they released a few days ago. And I gotta say, I, I use a cracked exit because I don't like to have my CD in my drive. The original is laying approximately two meters to my left. But uh, I use a cracked exe and, uh, well, it differs in three bytes. So <laughs> they did pretty much nothing with it. With it. They just cracked mm. out the CD tag, I guess. And mm. this is actually uh, something I would look forward to, that uh, the game may get a little bit more polishing, the polishing it deserves. I mean, it, it still runs very well. It's Thinking a about game. it, <laughs> yeah, it's it, exactly it's 20, 20 year, one years old and it still works rather well, like most of the Quake Three engine games. And yeah, uh, it's yeah. a credit to to the industry actually. There are a lot of games which don't work. Let's say when you went from Windows XP to Windows Vista and it, it was all shot to hell. And this game actually still works. It has yeah. its quirks, like it had back then, anyways. Mm -hmm. But in general, it works just fine. I'm really impressed. I, I still fire up uh, Jedi Outcast uh, or Jedi Academy every now and then and just play it for fun. 
and um, I'm impressed that it still works. I mean, there's a Open JK and stuff like that now where they, because we use the Quake engine, there's so many, there's so much support for, you know, making games work in it. Um, so Open JK, I think, was based off of the source code that was released, I think, and they've made some improvements for it for modern hardware and that sort of thing, um, fix some bugs and that sort of thing. Uh, so it's great that that's out there and that people can still play it. And I know that's not quite the same for Elite Force uh, because the source code was never released, but I'm glad that people can still play it. While we're um, at the topic of, of reminiscing, or we were, um, do you have any contact with, with the rest of the dev team from back then? Oh, yeah. I mean, until January of this year, I was still working with at least half of them. You know, James Monroe is still there at Raven. He was my boss and he was the lead programmer on that. Brian Pelletier, who was the project lead, he left Raven a little while ago, maybe 10, 10 years ago or so, but he's at a new place called Roundhouse uh, here in Madison that's also owned by ZeniMax. Uh, and ZeniMax was just bought by Microsoft. Uh, so we're all we're working for the same parent company and we're still in the same town. A lot of the people who worked on that are still are either still at Raven or at Roundhouse, uh, which used to be Human Head. Um, so yeah, I'm still in contact with a lot of those people. Some of them have moved away or moved on to other things, but I, I see them at least on Facebook, you know. So yeah, I've got good contact. Even um, the guy I worked with at uh, Paramount a lot, uh, Harry Lang, who was the, I think he was in charge of licensing at Paramount. He's not there anymore, but you know, I still uh, talk to him occasionally on, on Facebook. So yeah, I'm, I'm still in contact with most of the team. What I still find impressive is that there are still people caring for the game. Many uh, players may have noticed uh, during the last few days that the master servers of the game were offline. This has been going on for one or two years, but still someone seems to be caring because the master servers are back on again. What's this is for uh, Elite Force or Jedi? For Elite Force. Mm. I believe it, Jedi, I can't say, actually say a lot, lot about Jedi, but Elite Force I know, and it, the, the master was down for two years or something, and it, it's back up again, so somebody is caring, and uh, it's nice that some people, when being contacted, still care for the game. Yeah, this I mean... also I not, not very common for a 20-year-old game. I don't know who runs the master server for Elite Force, if that's someone at Raven or not. I know... Um, at least the domain our... points there. It's a Raven software domain, so... Okay. I guess cool. they you still own it and yeah so i know we run uh one of our it guys charlie runs the um and he's been there you know since back then right he runs the master server and maintains the master server for jedi so i imagine maybe he does the same for elite force but if it does ever go down i can provide a contact for you know a pretty much direct contact for you to talk to someone and say hey uh just fyi the server's down Hopefully we will not have to come back to you about this, but anyways, thanks for the possibility. Because we had the situation and it got resolved, but as I said, it's not necessarily normal for the industry. Well, I'm glad that uh, I'm glad that people are still enjoying these games, you know, 20 years later. I think it's very rewarding, I think, as a, as a game developer to know that people are getting so much enjoyment or at least good memories out of the out of the games that we worked so hard on. Definitely. I mean, this is something the captain and I were also talking about a few times, uh, that it's sometimes strange that certain developers don't seem to consider their, their work uh, like their baby, you know? M many people think this, this is my baby, I created this. And sometimes it shows and sometimes there's a, a strange lack of it and an elite force I believe there's a lot from both sides. The players, I mean, it's one or two days ago we, we had uh, an event, don't know, and we, we simply played and it still works and it's still fun. That's great. So from my point of view, uh, awesome work even today. Yeah, I uh, think one of the reasons why that might be is because Raven has been a very stable uh, studio. There's a lot of people who have been there a long time, like I was there 24 years, who remember the, the working on these things and maintain them we haven't had a lot of you know tumultuous turnover raven as a studio has been around at least 30 years now there's a lot of continuity there which i think makes it easier for them to look back at their games and, and remember them and feel pride for them or feel i don't a sense of ownership uh, uh, about them um, and responsibility to the community for them i mean there's a balance you have to strike you can't live in the past and devote too much effort or resources towards it because you, you have to keep making new games and, and um, you know uh, 
adapting to the industry. But, you know, I think we all like to, who worked on these games, we all like to look back and, and fondness and, you know, help the community however we can, uh, when we can. Looking back is exactly something I would be interested in. I mean, as someone, you said it, 24 years with Raven, um, you're a veteran. If you had to tell a new guy, a new person to the industry, something that you think is important, if you had to tell them something that you think is important that they should keep in mind, what would it be? Imagine you, you have a, a newbie somehow who says, well, I want to go into gaming industry. What would you tell them? I would tell them to follow their passion. I think the number one thing that will help you be successful, not just in gaming, but in any industry, but is if you're really passionate about it. If it's something you really want to do and you're passionate about it, you'll do it whether you're getting paid or not. You will, um, you know, like I was modding on my own or people make their own games or people will go to places like Full Sail or the Guild uh, or some, um, Guild Hall or something like that or, or all sorts of gaming um, programs that they have at colleges now. You can tell. I've interviewed tons and tons of people. You can tell when someone is doing it because they just have a passion for it. And that, I think, is the number one quality that people are looking for when they're hiring. Do you really have a passion for it? Is this something that you just really love to do? Because if you have that, then you'll be successful. We can teach everything else. We can teach the technical skills that you would need to know to do the job, but you have to have a passion for it. And you have to have, you know, a level of maturity uh, as well uh, to be able to work with other people and collaborate and cooperate. Um, communication skills and that sort of thing. But for me, the most, the thing I look for is whether or not someone's truly passionate about their work. And if you are passionate about something, if you love doing it, you'll be happy and you'll, you'll be better at your job and you'll just have a, a happier life. <laughs> so I would say follow your passion. And if your passion happens to be in video games, then I think you'll do well. So you would say it's still possible to go from modder to game developer? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Having something to show is always good. I mean, modding is a nice, easy way to, uh, especially for someone uh, who's more involved in design, right? You're a designer and not so much of a programmer. Although there's plenty of work for programmers in modding too. It's a great way to show what you can do because there's a platform already there, a game that's already there that you can build on uh, and not have to write a game from scratch. You know, I don't think we're not looking for people who can write a game from scratch necessarily unless they're like an, a, an engine. Uh, a programmer, an engine software engineer. You so know. in a way, you you already have to canvas. You don't have to get some wood and, and some some white thing to, to get painting on. You can simply pick up your brush and do things. Right, right. It's it's a great way to start. Um, nowadays, you know, you've got things like Unity and the Unreal Engine that make it really easy to get right into making a game and not have to write an engine from scratch yourself too. That's that's. Another, I think, good way for people to show what they can do and what their game sense is and what it is, their, their vision that they're trying to, to convey. Right. Uh, Captain, do you have uh, something else? Yeah, I have uh, a few short questions for you. Do you know, is there still the assimilated Raven logo in the studio? Somebody from the chat wants to know that. You know, that is a good question. Um, mean like the the rendered video of it or like a printed uh, out physical version i guess both yeah i don't know if i've ever saw a physical version of that uh that'd be great to 3d print out or something if we still have the source code and assets somewhere which last time i checked we still had the assets on the network somewhere uh that probably exists somewhere but it's you know it was rendered at low resolution so it's not gonna look great i forget who made that for us They'd probably have the original source files if they even had them at all anymore. But yeah, I don't think I ever saw a physical version of that. But that would be cool. From the chat days coming, there was a print. Oh, really? Uh, like a poster of it or something? Or like an actual physical printed out version? I'll have to ask uh, Brian about that next time I talk to him. He writes days a picture with the whole team and the picture of the, the logo. Really? Huh. I think I know which one. Well, I would have been in that picture, so I should remember this, but I do not remember that. I'll have to ask Brian if, if that still exists. Brian uh, raffles these, the, the studio head. In the meantime, another question. Did you ever play, or do you maybe in the future plan to play online, the, the Holo match? Uh, I wasn't even sure that you still could, but uh, you know, listening to your podcast uh, for, or YouTube video or whatever from last year where you're talking about it, it sounds like you actually still can. So 
Oh yeah. Uh, I might. I might hop on. I think back then my name was Chang Khan when I used to play online. Oh, now you're making yourself a target. <laughs> <laughs> I, I may um, not use the same name. Let's just say, don't be surprised if there are some players out there which really kick ass. <laughs> they have oh, been doing okay. this for 20 years, so... <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure. You know, I, I remember playing Jedi online, and, and um, at first, obviously, I had played it more than anyone else, so I was really good at it, but then... Very quickly, people got really good at that game. Then another thing, the community would like to share the information, especially the developer of the mod, that if you ever play Elite Force 2, play it with a co-op mod, and maybe even with a friend. Oh, there's a co-op mod? Yep, it's perfect. I have to be honest, I haven't kept up with the um, with yeah. all the mods for Elite Force uh, for years. I would have gotten back to this as well. There's a co-op mod for Elite Force 2 because the game itself doesn't have one. Mm. Uh, but some uh, very dedicated guy got it going. And well, Elite Force 2 does have a co-op where you can play the campaign and a few maps more together with your friends. So if, if you're into looking into Elite Force 2, give this a shot too. It's really worth it. Oh, I'll, I'll give it a shot. And if anyone has a photo of that uh, picture of us standing in front of that Elite Force the still needed a uh, Raven uh, logo. I'd love to see it. Okay, Saturn, you want to go ahead with the last question? I got one in between and then the usual. Okay, then go ahead. Imagine money wouldn't be an issue. You know, you, you get the money or the resources to do whatever you want. What would be your dream project? If mm. someone were to say to you, doesn't matter how much it costs, what would you do? Video game project? Could be, um, but not necessarily. Something that, where you would say this is something that would move myself. Star Trek related, I would want to do uh, either a new Star Trek series like uh, that I think kind of takes the spirit of the next generation in the original series and moves it forward. But obviously I don't have that license. <laughs> or I would love to develop something like a, um, a Star Trek game that was, you know, open universe and... You know, not necessarily MMO, because there's a lot of aspects of MMOs that I don't really like that are designed to kind of just um, make you grind and use as much of your time as possible in the game to keep you in it. But it'd be interesting to be able to create some sort of world, um, game world, where you could just wander around in it with your starship of friends and, and uh, go on adventures, you know, somewhat procedurally generated maybe, but have all the, the Star Trek elements in there, you know, the Klingons and... Romulans and, um, you know, Orions and Cardassians and, and all that sort of stuff, but just be able to go around and just do episodic missions. I think that could be kind of fun. You know, it's, it's, it's kind of, of cool because there's a game out there called Pulsar. Captain and I have been playing this a few times and actually this is pretty much a direction you're describing, oh, really? but it's not track at all. No track universe. They, they have their own, own story and their own lore, so to say. But here's the point. We were thinking a lot of times, this is basically what Star Trek could be. A Star Trek game. Pretty mm. much what you just described. Pro you, you maybe procedurally um, created uh, missions. Um, you can explore the, the universe, uh, drive your ship. The game places you in a situation where you have up to four players which have certain roles like engineer, helmsman, a captain, engineer, and they can control their own ship yeah, very much like Star Trek did. It looks very Star Trek, yeah, I'm looking at it right now, that's cool. And we were thinking this, the same thing, a game that is like, like that, but in the Star Trek universe, that'd be so cool. Yeah, yeah, and I, I wish that they would, um, you know, if I was in charge at uh, Paramount or whatever licensing department, I would see that game and be like, hey, let's talk to these people about making a Star Trek version of this. Uh, yeah, or exactly. Like that. Yeah. Just like um, probably the other one would be, uh, I, I'm a dungeon master, and I wish that Dungeons and Dragons would make an online version of their game that has all the rules built in and automated. This pandemic would have been the perfect time to have a tool like that available for players to play remotely with each other. But I don't know why they haven't done that yet. Oh, yeah. So, this is the part of the video where we open the mic to you. Is there anything you would like to mention? Anything we missed? Um, no, I, th I think that was pretty comprehensive. It was uh, fun to talk about it again and um, share some of the stories uh, behind it. Um, it was, like I said, one of my favorite experiences in my entire development career so far. Um, I, I love playing in the 
Star Trek universe. It's not something I ever thought I would have gotten a chance to do. And when I went to Raven, you know, they did fantasy games. Uh, I never thought I'd get to work in not just fantasy, which I love because of Dungeons and Dragons, of course, but I got to work in Star Trek. I got to work in Star Wars and I got to make Marvel games, which is like the only thing I feel like I, I haven't gotten to do is play around in the Aliens universe. But, you know, four out of five is not bad at all. And so I'm I'm pretty happy with it. It was a great experience. I wish we could have done more Star Trek, but then again, we got to do Star Wars right after, so that was great, too. Um, it's funny, yeah. because I just got the picture you requested. Oh, yeah. A user Plokai Wolf was sending it to me. Let's see if I can share it with you. Maybe like that. It should be coming in right now. Thanks to Plokai Wolf. Wow, I don't recognize that at all. I feel like that must have been photoshopped in later or something. <laughs> I, I know the picture. It's in-game, in I know. It is part of the assets of the game. I feel like someone photoshopped that later. I don't think that's part of the original photo. When, when I have a look I, at the lighting, it actually looks rather realistic. So I recognize that, this photo. Um, and I'm... I'm uh, if you look in the middle, there's these two Asian guys with beards. Kind of like looking at the camera kind of like uh like they're angry yeah. or something yeah yeah, that, yeah. That, that's me on the left and then on the right that's kim lathrop that's the guy whose middle name was austin and i'm the guy in the striped shirt okay i would say let's close this off but first i want to say thank you very much for joining us and all the work you did on this game i guess i speak for the whole community we still love this game to play even today it's yeah 20 years what i write yeah, it's been it's been uh, great to see you know the game just still being enjoyed now. You know, it's uh, very like I said, very rewarding. Makes it all worth it. <laughs> Most definitely, be proud of that. It has given a lot of people a lot of fun for a long time, even today. Well, thank you for this uh, for this opportunity to talk about it. It's been fun. Good. Then I would say that's it for this video. Leave us a comment. Tell us what you think about the game, and of course, play the game. Until next time. Bye, guys. <laughs> bye bye.